but I appreciate the introduction and the, and the invitation. I, I like uh, both, the, both subtitles on the conference, really, the, the uh, balance sheet and uncertainty. I'm not sure if they're supposed to be contestants or uh, teammates. I, I view them as teammates, really. I, I think as an economist thinking about uncertainty, insurance is something that comes to mind pretty quickly. And you know, debt contracts and credit arrangements are they are partly insurance contracts, especially a credit contract where default's a possibility. Uh, not to mention many other financial instruments uh, have insurance aspects to them. So I think it's great to, to look at them together. What I've been uh, working on is thinking about some of the mechanisms uh, that might link uncertainty to the labor market. Uh, I'm sorry, I got nothing to say about Wall Street or buying stocks and bonds. I don't know anything about that. Uh, I'm trying to link it with employment um, and the wages and those type of issues. And maybe two buckets to kind of throw mechanisms into to kind of organize the thinking would be, roughly speaking, labor demand and labor supply. And the labor demand bucket contains a variety of explanations, but what they have in common is they tend to push real wages lower. That uh, when there's more uncertainty, workers find that they earn less, say, on a per hour basis. One version of that, uh, the labor demand theory that has that wage implication, uh, is that businesses are afraid to invest when they're not sure about the future. And if you're the type of person who makes investment goods, you're going to find yourself without work because your customers are too scared uh, to do the, the building or creation that you normally do. Um, let me give you kind of a back of the envelope uh, indication of how big that effect might be through the investment channel. So what I did, I'm going to turn, I'm going to conclude, it's a small number, so I try to be generous to start out my calculation and say, let's say the entire investment drop during the latest recession, all of it, was due to heightened uncertainty. Well, investment fell about $2,000 per capita. That's a lot by historical standards, but that's still only 4% of GDP. And if there were a 4% drop in the demand for labor, or maybe you think labor supply is very elastic, then you get a 4% drop in labor. Economists don't really think that. They think a 4% drop in the demand for labor would something reduce the amount of labor by about 1%. So that's something. I mean, 1% drop in labor would be a recession all by itself, but it's only about one-tenth of, of how much labor fell uh, in this recession. And that way, regard the VARs that Nick showed us uh, line up kind of close with this type of calculation that uh, if it's working through the investment channel. Now another version of of the uncertainty channel is that employers maybe perceive a future cost to employment. Um, maybe the uh, new health care act is going to involve some fees on employers and they're concerned about that and so they're not hiring right now. Um, that's often called uncertainty. It might, I'm not sure if it's a first or second moment, but we, we don't need to quibble about that. We'll call that uncertainty. But the point here is that's another factor where uncertainty or something like it is pushing wages down, that employers are <coughs> not uh, willing to pay that much over and above the paycheck uh, that their employees get. And a third version um, is that uncertainty affects markup behavior, again pushing down wages. Now in the labor supply bucket, there's also some ideas there that wages would be pushed lower. Uh, there's an idea that households, when they face uncertainty, they want to save more. Um, I'm not sure I agree with that, but that's a, that's a point of view. But we tend to push wages lower, because one, one way that people can save low, more is by working more. So they're going to be eager to work, even if wages, wages are kind of low. What I want to focus on today uh, is another mechanism that uncertainty can change the demand for social insurance in particular in the direction of people demanding more social insurance. And when that happens, <coughs> wages after taxes will fall. So that's, in that regard, it's a wage reduction theory. But in the short term, wages before taxes will rise. So that makes it pretty different <coughs> than the other three or four theories I mentioned, that it would tend to, at least in the short term, to some relatively small degree, increase wages rather than push them down. 
So I, I'm going to show you some more data later. But I brought a couple series just to get us started. These are wage series. Um, they're detrended, removed a, the time trend from before the recession. And they're put on an index scale. So 100 refers to what was in place in uh, the fourth quarter of 2007. The black series is a measure of pre-tax wages, more or less what it costs an employer to have an employee on an hourly basis. The red series is the real wage after taxes and benefits. The red series reflects the reward from a worker's point of view to working. How much does he add to his family's living standard by working rather than not working? And that index uh, fell sharply. Notice the scale, the vertical axis scale, goes all the way down to 87. So there was a sharp drop in the reward to working. Now, if you look at the black series, I kind of see it going up. Other economists have looked at that same series and say that they see downward pressure. I don't want to quibble with them there. I just want to say when you put it on the scale from 87 to 103, whatever's going on with the black series does not look like a very impressive drop, um, if there's any drop there. Where, where the impressive drop has occurred is with the reward to work. So I, um, in the paper that we circulated, I used a, an old model in economics. It's been used repeatedly, uh, called the principal agent model. Um, a lot of economists have contributed to it as development. Um, I've mentioned a few here. And that little model says it thinks about what workers produce and tries to put that production into different buckets. And so one of the buckets I call N here would be the production that's a result of their effort. <coughs> they uh, put in a lot of effort, they produce a lot. Put a little effort, they produce less. And the other two terms are deviations from that. So sometimes a lot is produced <coughs> holding constant the effort. Uh, those are kind of luck terms. And I put in kind of two luck terms. One's a random or luck term that's public information that everybody can see. Um, they can understand, well, this worker didn't produce a lot because it rained too much on his farm or something like that. It's public information. But then there's a second factor there affecting the output that's not so public. <coughs> and people see the output's low and they're not sure, is, is it, was it a lack of effort on this guy's part or uh, some other kind of bad luck? Now the public information, in the model at least, gets perfectly insured. So if output's low for somebody because of what the public can see is something that's no fault of their own, then they're going to get help. Um, and they don't have to worry about that. But they'd also like some help on the other shop. And that's where social insurance comes in. Social insurance comes in and says to people, we're going to take a fraction of your output, one minus mu, and that's going to go toward helping people with bad luck. Um, and you're going to keep mu of your output. So the disposable income a worker has for his family now is some part of his effort, mu, some part of this luck that he's trying to ensure, mu times epsilon, and then B is the benefit that uh, he's getting from participating in the insurance. Uh, I think you can think of it as a government benefit that he would get if his output were zero. <coughs> sometimes they call uh, mu the self-reliance rate, one minus mu sometimes called the marginal tax rate. And there's a budget constraint for this social insurance scheme or government insurance program that says that all that we collect from people, and is the total effort that workers in the economy put forth, all that we collect from people, 1 minus mu times n, has to equal what we spend. Um, that would be the budget constraint. Then I kind of set this up as a we call it an optimal tax problem. It's done in two stages. First, we look at people who have no control over the government policy. They have no control over this mu variable. They just understand that they're going to share part of their output with the government or with the insurance program, and they react accordingly. That's the first stage of the analysis. Then once we capture how people behave under the policy, then we think about well, what would be the optimal policy, recognizing that that policy affects behavior. And so the first step is shown here. Um, individuals 
um, are going to choose their effort, recognizing that the reward to that effort is just mu. They only get a fraction mu of the result of their effort. So the, the optimal effort for people depends on, number one, their taste. Gamma is a taste for effort. Obviously, they, if they dislike effort, they won't do much. But the other thing that matters here is holding constant their taste is how much they keep from you, how much of their output do they keep. The more that they keep, the more effort they'll put forth. And then I define uh, safety. Um, there's a lot of ways one can do this, but I'm relating safety to the uncertainty in the living standards of the person. How much does this person's living standards vary um, according to these things he can't control? That's called SC, and I refer to safety as kind of the inverse of that. If his living standards vary a lot, according to things he can't control, that would be less safety. If they don't vary at all, that would be perfect safety. The safety index would kind of be, on a, be the number one. And we can kind of plot uh, the relationship between efficiency and safety here, and that's what I've done in a little graph. On the, on the uh, horizontal axis, I've plotted efficiency from zero to one. One would be full efficiency, means that people work the efficient amount. Uh, less than one would be working less than that. You can imagine even go beyond one, people might work more than the efficient amount. We won't really run into that today, but that could happen. And then safety is on the vertical axis. More safety is higher up and less safety is lower down. And there's a trade-off. We like to have our cake and eat it too, but you, society can't have that. Uh, we could go to one extreme and say to people, you're on your own, no help. Um, from these things you can't control. And that would get people working hard, but they have very little safety in their life. And that's what I've indicated with the arrow. The other extreme, I don't even want to call it communism or something, it says, you know what, no matter what effort you put forth, it doesn't affect how much you have. Um, that means basically everything that you have goes to the government or to the insurance scheme. And that would be a lot of safety. You would know exactly what you're getting. Um, uh, but would be very efficient because people wouldn't work very much when they know that their effort doesn't benefit them. And society has to balance between these two extremes. Um, and that can be a political decision or it may be a more careful economic decision, but whatever, there's a balance there. And this uh, second stage of the optimal tax problem thinks about, well, what determines the optimal balance um, at the margin? <coughs> And so I've taken, at the top line here, I've taken the indirect utility function from the problem we looked at earlier. And um, it reflects that effort depends on the amount of social insurance. And then we'd ask, well, what's the amount of social insurance that's the best for people? Balancing these two things, safety and efficiency. And the results aren't too surprising, and they're not even new to me. Uh, the more people are concerned about safety, the more risk averse they are then the more social insurance there'll be and the less effort there will be. It's not that people are ignorant, they don't understand that social insurance reduces effort, they just say I'm willing to tolerate inefficiency in this effort to get that safety that's important to us. The thing, uh, another thing that, uh, difference you could analyze is what happens if there's more uncertainty, more variance in this thing that's beyond people's control. Well that will also increase the demand for social insurance. Um, so those are two factors. You can think about the total level of uncertainty, but my model makes a pretty sharp distinction between <coughs> the factors hitting people that are public, that everybody kind of understands and can help them with, and the factors that are harder to understand. And in my notation, the latter was called epsilon. And another thing that can happen is maybe uncertainty is constant. We have a certain amount of uncertainty, but it's kind of changed categories. The things that used to hit people publicly now are more private or confusing. That would also increase the demand for social insurance. People would react to that and say, I still want some help with these things that are hitting me, and I'll tolerate less efficiency for that. I've drawn a little diagram for that here. Here, you, you, this uh, red curve, you can think of that trade-off that society's dealing with before the recession, and society chose a point, maybe it was an optimal point, or politically expedient point. They chose a point, but then the frontier moved on that because now there's more uncertainty, especially the kind of uncertainty 
that's not so publicly understood. Now, if, if people were already sharing everything they, they made, that, that wouldn't really affect them. That would be up at the point at the top there. But the more that they were on their own, the more this uncertainty <coughs> hurts. So it looks like kind of a twist. And one thing that, one way society could have responded, in the sense it would have been technically feasible, they could have responded by saying, we're not going to change the degree of social insurance. What we had before is what we're going to stick with. And you'd be at a spot like in the hollow circle here that says that, guess what, we got less safety, but we're going to keep the efficiency the same. My interpretation, and the interpretation that kind of follows from that social insurance program, is that society reacted to this situation by saying, let's try to buy back some of that safety, paying the price of inefficiency. So let's move up spot here. We still have less safety than we did before, but we're not as bad off as we would be if we just kept our social insurance programs constant and uh, kept efficiency constant and went, just gave it all up in terms of safety. So my theory in the sense of what, what happened is there was an increase in uncertainty. People demanded insurance rationally, demanded more insurance, recognizing it would depress the labor market, but it's the best response in a bad situation. Uh, so that's kind of my theory. I, I mentioned earlier, it's not just my theory. It's a, it's a theory that's been around a lot. And it's, in a sense, it's a theory that's too powerful. Economists have used it for years. Um, Benabou, for example, has a series of papers using that type of model saying, where there's more inequality, we ought to have more redistribution. We ought to have more social insurance. And it's actually been hard to find in the data, so in a sense, it's a too powerful of a theory. But guess what? In the last two years, we have had more social insurance. The, the theory actually works now. Um, during the beginning of the recession, social insurance went up. Here I'm measuring uh, marginal tax rate over time <coughs> for kind of a typical middle class household. And this measures if, if they spend a quarter less of the year working, how much of their paycheck would be replaced by government help whether it be unemployment insurance, or sometimes Medicaid, or food stamps, or earned income tax credit, uh, programs like that. And we can see that the amount of help that people got while they were not working, if and when they were not working, went up. Uh, they got 40% help before the recession, and it peaked out at, at the, when the stimulus was at its peak, it peaked out at 48%, and then came down somewhat, especially with the payroll tax cut, um, reduce that, get a lot of people to keep more of what they make when they're working. Um, and I didn't, wasn't able to, uh, in time for today, to extend it, but the payroll tax cut expired, so the red line kind of goes up two more points, and now it's sitting around 46%. Uh, percent. Either way, it's a, quite a bit higher than it was uh, before the recession. So the next thing I did is I took, again, the same old model, and I asked, <coughs> could this model not only explain why social insurance increased, but could it explain why it increased eight points? And actually, the theory is less about the marginal tax rate and more about what you keep. Can it explain why what people kept went from 60 before the recession down to 52? Um, and part of it, it depends, it depends on how much uncertainty increased. And that's where I would have to rely on Nick and others to try to measure this. Um, Another factor would matter if risk aversion changed. Financial economists think that risk aversion changes over time. And if risk aversion was higher during the last couple of years, then that will also increase the demand for social insurance. So all I've been able to say at this stage, until we have good measures of, independent measures of risk aversion <coughs> and good quantitative measures of uncertainty, I've been able to say, you know, with kind of reasonable increases in uncertainty or risk aversion or both, you could get the kind of increase in marginal tax rates that we had in the last couple of years. Um, now let me go back to the mechanisms. I'm going to look at these marginal tax rates in a little different way. Go back to the mechanisms to, to try to look at the supply and demand buckets. So the, the social insurance creates a gap between what people get and what they produce. And you can kind of think of that gap as occurring in two places. One with the employee directly and the other with the employer. And so I've looked at a couple of those. Employer wedge is something I mentioned, the ACA, the Affordable Care Act penalties would be something on the employer side. Uh, and 
I mentioned uh, unemployment insurance would be a program on the employee side. And what I've done is kind of construct uh, measures of gaps between wages and productivity and wages and what employees keep, both on the employer and the employee side. And one finding is both, both of these are important. So the kind of investment story would kind of work through an employer wedge. It would make employers less willing to hire, holding constant what employees cost. And some of the social insurance programs <coughs> clearly define what a pair on the employee side. So I, would, I made uh, some calculations of these, employee wedge and the employer wedge. Um, first thing I guess you see is the employee wedge is a lot bigger. Uh, it increases a lot more. Um, 14 or 16 points here means it's like there was a new tax of 14 or 16 percent of payroll, something on that order. Both, these, by the way, both these wedges are in tax rate units, so you can compare them, add them, subtract them. Um, they're like tax rates. And the employer wedge is much smaller. However, the employer wedge is pretty large. It, it went up maybe three points overall, especially since mid-2009. I don't know if it's a coincidence or not, that's when the Affordable Care Act got put on the table. But in any case, it, it increased three or four points. That's a lot. That doesn't happen very often historically, um, but it's happened. But still, the dominant wedge would be the employee wedge. Now, the theory says that the marginal tax rate series that I measured based on government policy, government policy doesn't go into any of this measurement. These are based on employer and employee behavior. Uh, the black series ought to match up with the marginal tax rate series I showed you. So there's the marginal tax rate series again. Um, and they match up fairly, fairly closely, not perfectly. The employee wedge is larger um, even now than before the recession, and so is the marginal tax rate. OK, I just have a little time left, so I skip this graph and go to the conclusions. Uh, my first conclusion is really to reiterate and reapply an old theory to modern events, which is to say that uncertainty, fear, and risk aversion affect the demand for social insurance. The optimal degree of risk of social insurance is sensitive to these variables quantitatively. And unless we have some kind of free lunch at, at our disposal, well, there's a trade-off. And if we're going to have more social insurance, we're going to have a smaller labor market. In a sense, fear is kind of the beginning of this whole process. So I like for FDR's quote, supposedly he said this, I'm not old enough to remember, he said the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And this is a model in which fear creates social insurance and social insurance um, depresses the labor market. The second conclusion is, is that uncertainty <coughs> could affect the quantity of labor more through the social insurance mechanism than maybe through the investment mechanism. And those are some of the calculations I showed you. And then last, is regardless of where this extra social insurance came from, we got it. We have more social insurance now. And it's one of the biggest changes we've seen in years, and it's big enough to just significantly depress the labor market, five, five percentage points or more. Um, so thank you.